கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to the second part of this <laughs> video about Ananya Bhava. We started to discuss this point in the last episode, but we ran out of time. So I'm going to try to come to the point here quickly and then we can discuss it further. Since God is our real self. Why does Sri Bhagavan praise and pray to him in many of his verses as if he were separate from himself? So if you've been following this discussion so far, we subscribe to the Ananya Bhakti, the idea that God is not separate, not different from the self. And by the self, of course, we mean Brahman, the consciousness, uh, the non-dual being that we all are, that is everything and in everyone. So if that's the case, if the truth, the real truth of existence is non-duality, then why does Bhagwan or other Ananya Bhaktas refer to God as him? Huh? Why doesn't he really say, well, I, I am God? No, you never hear him say that. So why is that? Only very, uh, how can I say, very neophyte non-dualists who don't really understand the philosophy will say silly things like, I am God. <laughs> one time I got a ride hitchhiking with one of these characters. And he's going, I am God. Ah, oh, very good, I said. So if you're God, just create a small insect here on my hand. huh? Anything, you know, a fly, a bee, uh, you know, whatever. Just, just create it out of nothing, okay? Of course, he couldn't do it. <laughs> His girlfriend was there in the car and she was looking at him and looking at me. Finally, he said, you know, I, I think I'm going to drop you off here. <laughs> you ask too many inconvenient questions. Well, I like to think about things. So we say that God is the creator and the cause of the universe. And then we uh, give him all kinds of powers to do anything. So if that's the case, well, what's the problem? Huh? If you're God, can you create just a little insect on my hand, you know, or anywhere, just on the dashboard here? Shouldn't be any problem, right? <laughs> but no, God had to throw me out of the car, I guess, for blasphemy. <laughs> so let's go on. The truth is that long before he composed these hymns, Sri Bhagavan had lost his individual ego and realized the absolute reality that we call God. Now, of course, when we create the idea of God, the definition or the category of existence, the ontological truth called God, we do so because we are in duality. We have, as you might say, abdicated. We have left our original position of non-dual existence and come into duality. So in duality, we are no longer the whole. We are no longer everything. We are limited. And because we have limited ourselves, then when we experience phenomena like the world 
and other things, we have to ascribe a cause because now we're in time and cause and effect, karma, are valid concepts in that mind space. So how do we explain? Huh? Where is this world coming from? We're not willing to take responsibility. No, I just want my car and my house and my girlfriend. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with taking responsibility for the whole cosmos. So God did it. That's the answer, is God. So, all right, what does that mean? Bhagwan composed these hymns to teach us by example how we should depend entirely upon the supreme power that we call the grace of God or guru. So in other words, guru is the mediator between the separated self in illusion, the ego, the mind, the restricted, limited self, and the self, with a capital S, uh, the one who is all and aware of everything. So the guru comes to mediate between these two concepts of self. And of course, the guru himself has realized his self. But when we see a real guru like Ramana, he is not rigid in his concepts. He doesn't say, you are everything and you are God and so take responsibility and that's it. No, no, it doesn't work because we are in a hypnotic trance. We have convinced ourselves that we are a separate individual being. We have created this duality and now we're living in it. So. If somebody tries to approach us with this, with this idea that you are the all, you are everything, huh? we'll reject it. We'll say, no, 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 it's not me. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> I can't take responsibility for this. So the guru has to start where we are at. He can't bring us immediately to the highest truth. And this is where the neo adwaitans lose it because they have this rigid belief huh? just like people in illusion in maya have a rigid belief that they are separate and individual the neo-advaitans have a rigid belief that they are the absolute they are everything and they can't let it go they're clinging to this belief so even though they say they're not religious they actually are just like scientists, you know, scientists cling to scientific truth as if it's everything, even though most of the assumptions behind empiricism have never been validated and could never be validated because they are simply assumptions, especially the difference between the observer and the observed. And of course, quantum mechanics is breaking that down, but that's a whole nother discussion. Let's go on. <laughs> so the question we want to address here is, why did Sri Ramana teach us to depend upon God or Guru as if he were separate from ourself? So now he's going to explain this in detail basically the same thing that I just explained. When we arise as a finite individual ego by imagining ourself to be a physical body, we create the illusion that we are different from the one infinite reality, our true self. The nature of our real self is infinite love because the self is full of perfect happiness. We naturally love ourself more than anything else. But in dualistic consciousness, we mistake the self to be the mind or the individual consciousness. And of course, 
the individual is simply a reflection of the whole. But it's usually a distorted reflection. In other words, we are seeing the whole as something separate, and that we, I, the body, exist within that whole as a separated part and parcel, jivatma. Actually, we are the atma, we are the whole, nothing but the whole, just like the wave of the ocean is nothing but water. Huh? The ocean and the wave are both just water, but the wave wants to have a separate identity. And of course, the wave is actually connected with the ocean and is nothing but the ocean. But try to convince him of that. <laughs> Therefore, when we seemingly separate from our real self by imagining the ego as a finite individual, we separate from the infinite power of our true self-love. Feeling lonely? <laughs> That's because you consider yourself to be separate from everything. And at the end of this, after we go through the philosophy, I'm going to talk about the experience of being separate versus uh, uh, recognizing and realizing oneself as the self. When we separate from our infinite power of self-love, we feel that we are an individual having only limited power. And we experience our true self-love in distorted forms, as narcissism, and as desire for many objects and experiences that we imagine will make us happy. In other words, there's this tremendous emptiness in the center of our being, and we strive to fill it by various imaginary uh, self-gratifications, uh, such as self-love, narcissism, which means love of the ego, the separated, illusory self. And of course, that doesn't really satisfy because the self is an illusion. The ego doesn't really exist. So, all right, if that doesn't work, <laughs> then let's try consuming all of these sensory objects and pleasures and so forth. And of course, that doesn't work either, huh? because those things <laughs> are, in our current consciousness, just separate objects. And there's always going to be a difference between the subject, myself, and the objects that I try to enjoy. So they're never going to really satisfy me. Huh? And more than that, I'm going to see the world and God as separate from me and with their own agendas, depending on how I view myself, okay? So if I see myself as being a detached and lusty person, an individual, I'm going to see the world and God like that too. But we'll get into that more at the end. As a finite individual ego or mind with limited power, we imagine the supreme omnipotence of our actual self to be another. We see our actual self externally as God, not only as God, but as the world. And we imagine that the world has a soul, and that soul is God. And then whatever happens in the world is God's will. But since God is a separate individual from ourselves, he must have his own agenda, right? <laughs> because we know from experience that we don't always get what we want. So somebody else must want something different to happen. And of course, that would be God. Thus, when we imagine ourselves to be a finite individual, we perceive God as a separate being huh? with a separate purpose and separate standards and separate everything. His whole program is different from ours and there's a conflict there. When we remain as our real non-dual self, nothing other than the self exists. 
But when we arise as a separate individual by imagining the ego as a material body, we perceive an apparently external world created and controlled by a power that we call God. This is illusion or maya. Ma means not. Ya means that which exists. So maya is that which does not really exist. It's a story that we tell ourselves to rationalize this suffering, miserable, frustrating condition of dualistic consciousness. Huh? Deep down somewhere unconsciously we know that we are the self. But since we can't identify with the being the self, we project the self externally as the world and God. And then we create this whole drama, <laughs> this whole dialogue between ourselves and God huh? or the world taken as a representative or a creation of God. So this is going on. And of course, irreligious people have a very contentious, uncomfortable, intense relationship with God and his world huh? because they totally identify only with the body. And then they uh, foresee God as an enemy. They foresee the world as a challenge, a hostile place. We'll get into this more at the end. I want to finish the philosophical part and then we can go on. Thus, the individual ego or mind, the world and God come into existence simultaneously as illusory consequences of desire, ignorance and delusion. This is a very important point. In other words, the world, the way we see it as a separate thing outside of ourselves and God as the creator and controller of that world are just as much of an imaginary thing as the individual self or mind. In fact, they are all consequences of our decision to become an individual. As soon as we become separate from the self, then the world and God come into existence also. And this has very specific consequences, which can be summed up in the word suffering. As long as we experience the mind as real, the universe, the ego, God, and his power of love or grace seem equally real. So this is the way out. If we approach a realized being, a guru, he can reveal to us the actual truth, but not all at once, in stages. So the first stage is acknowledging that God is real. And this is Vaidhi Bhakti. Vaidhi Bhakti means, okay, I exist as an individual in the world and God is real. So therefore, I have to have a relationship with God and not a contentious or difficult relationship, a loving and beautiful relationship. So the first step toward that is to follow God's laws. Now, if God is the creator of everything and everyone, then all beings are his children. So I should have good relationships with all other beings and not exploit or harm them in any way. That's my first step toward reconstituting my relationship with God. Then in the next stage, Raga Nuga Bhakti, I approach closer to God. I pick a particular form of God that matches my individual tastes. And I develop an ecstatic, deep, intense, loving relationship and reciprocation with that form of God. Huh? 
Now, of course, from the point of view of Advaita, this is all imaginary. <laughs> so it can be anything you want. See, in uh, Vaidhi Bhakti, they're teaching you can only have a relationship with uh, certain forms of God which are given in the scriptures. And you can only have certain forms of relationship too. But in Raganuga Bhakti, the whole thing becomes much more open and creative. Uh, because by now the relationship is on the platform of love. So because of that, now the positive relationship is established, trust is established, and the possibilities expand enormously, exponentially. So that leads to the highest stage, Ananya Bhakti, where we realize, oh, actually, God is our own real self. Since we imagine ourselves to be an individual, separate from our infinite power, we are now wholly dependent upon God and his grace, the guru. So in order to attain a normal, healthy relationship with God, we have to rely on the guru. Why? Because the guru knows God and we don't. The guru is realized and we're not. So in the beginning, we have to take the instruction of the guru very, very seriously. We have to go deep into that instruction and understand how it's for our benefit. So when we do this, gradually we will rise through the different layers of reality and relationship with God. And finally, we will find ourselves at the doorstep of self-realization. So what does this all mean experientially? How do we actually experience this uh, transformation of our relationship with God from a contentious uh, individual one to a harmonious, beautiful one, and finally to complete identification? Well, in the beginning, as I said, we conceive of ourselves as an individual separate from God. So we look at the world as if it was another being. We look at God as if he is another being, separate from ourselves, with a different agenda, a different desire, a different will. And so we conceive ourselves as being in conflict with God. Because after all, if God creates the world, God owns the world. It's his world, not ours. And we feel like a stranger in a strange land. This is anomie. The word anomie means self-alienation. We are actually alienated from ourselves, from our real self. And we are thinking the world is something completely different and alien. So this, of course is the origin of the attitude, especially in Western culture, of exploiting nature. Uh, that it's okay to exploit nature because after all, if we don't, nature will exploit us. <laughs> so this is kind of war going on between humanity and nature. And of course, we see where this has brought us to the point where the water and the air, the earth are all polluted then there are the horrible, ugly cities sprawling everywhere, completely out of harmony with the ecology. And we're on the verge of a mass extinction of most of the species on the planet and on and on and on. So, okay, obviously this attitude causes suffering, not only for us, but for everybody. It's terrible. It's a disaster. So then how do we fix it? Well, only religious faith can fix it. Because in the beginning, we see God and the world as separate. We see there's a relationship with them as contentious. And we see that we have to come into alignment with God's agenda. So the first step of actual spiritual life is becoming harmless. It's becoming... Uh, a steward of the earth 
instead of an exploiter. It is becoming a lover of God's creation and his creatures instead of someone who is dangerous and harmful. So this is why all religions teach nonviolence, all bona fide religions <laughs> teach nonviolence and vegetarianism and similar things designed to keep us from being too horrible, horrible, huh? and maybe just a little nasty. <laughs> now it's an improvement. But then the next stage is when instead of simply following rules, we actually begin to recognize that we have a deep love relationship with God. Raga Nuga Bhakti is not based on rules. In fact, in Raga Nuga Bhakti, there aren't any rules. And the reason for this is that love cannot be legislated. Love has to be a spontaneous attraction to something beautiful. So the God that we imagine or that we would want for ourselves is the God that we worship. And we worship that God appropriately. So God can be male or female. God can be young or old. God can even be an animal form, huh? like in the Vedic tradition. There are so many animal forms of God. Or God could be seen as the creator, the maintainer, the destroyer, like that. So all of these forms are basically imaginary. So it doesn't really matter which one we choose. We choose the one we like the best. And also the mode of worship. Since the form is imaginary, the mode of worship is also imaginary, so we can pick whatever form of worship we like. Huh? Of course, there's the classic puja offering the five elements. You know, the, uh, the bell is the sound in air, and then the lamp is the fire. Huh? Then there's water, incense, and so on. These represent the five elements. And then the form of God in the temple, of course, is fixed by scriptures. But that's Vaidhi Bhakti. Once we get into real Bhakti, Raga Nuga Bhakti, the worship could be anything. Whatever pleases this particular form of God that we love. So I'm not going to go into the details, but when I reached this stage, I extended a form of God already found in the scriptures. And I created so many pastimes and so many uh, moods of relationship that had never existed before. And that's all right. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what Raga Nuga Bhakti is all about. And later on, when we go deeper into Raga Nuga in our, a later series, we'll get into all these details. But how does that work out experientially? Well, in the beginning, as I said, one is in contention with God and is uh, at war with his world. But then if one accepts Vaidhi Bhakti and follows the rules, then one begins to behave responsibly in the world and become not an enemy, but a friend to all creatures. And then in Raganuga Bhakti, it gets even better. One becomes a lover of God and starts to see the world as their lover's expression or embodiment. Huh? If God is the soul of creation, then the world is his body. And I live within that body. So whatever happens has meaning now. Nature is not then simply arbitrary, alien, and strange, inhuman. Huh? Nature now becomes a reflection of my beloved. And everything that happens has a meaning. Huh? Now, of course, materialistic people think this is nuts. But I think they're nuts, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> what happens is that one's existence 
is transformed from a struggle against nature to a beautiful dance with nature. And of course, we have the wonderful example of Bhagwan, that uh, Ramana was friends with all the animals on the hill. Huh? Even the wildcats. In those days, there were mountain lions living on the hill. He would talk to them. He would tell them what to do and to stay away from places that, that people came so that the people wouldn't, get, wouldn't be disturbed, wouldn't be afraid. You know, I've had a lot of experiences in nature, camping and stuff like this. And I never felt afraid of the wild animals. In fact, I was always more cautious around people because <laughs> they're the ones that can really cause the damage. But the animals, in my experience, if you treat them with respect, give them space, and talk with them affectionately, they respond. So I've never had any trouble in all the years that I lived outdoors, uh, camping and stuff like that. I never had any trouble with wild animals. So this is my experience, and this is the experience of everyone who becomes really a friend to nature as being the body or form of God. And then, of course, when one realizes Ananya Bhakti, and realizes that, oh, actually, the world and God are within me, the self. All the phenomena that appear are nothing but internal uh, happenings within myself. Huh? Then one can begin to shape the reality according to one's wishes. Huh? And of course, there are still going to be surprises, just like sometimes our material body surprises us. <laughs> but that's okay. The way the world works is according to our view of it. So if we see the world as separate from ourselves, we suffer because then we're in a competitive relationship with the world. But when we see the world and God as simply our own internal state, then there's no contentious relationship because the world is our self. So this is the experience of the realized being. And this is why they're always blissful and happy, and no matter what happens in the world, because they realize the world is within me, the world is within my consciousness, and I have something to say about what's going on. Huh? And even if something surprising happens, I can just enjoy it because I know it's just temporary and the whole thing is actually an illusion. So that in that way, all suffering disappears and there's only knowledge and bliss, being knowledge and bliss, sat, chit, ananda. And that is the ultimate aim of all bhakti practice. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Karudakadinal Gum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam.